Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 2204. Be prepared to be inspired. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today I'm in Los Angeles, California, with a very special guest by the name of Andrew Comrie Picard. Andrew, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have any gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? Absolutely. Let's go. You've done that a few times. Now, before I give you a proper introduction, what's one little thing that maybe people don't know about you, Andrew? Well, I got some dark secrets. <laughs> I, uh, b- before I became a pro racer, uh, when I was a kid, I was a remote control car racer uh, of a pretty serious order. When I was 13 years old or so, I was uh, racing remote control cars. And actually, uh, my sponsors flew me around the world of, to race them. So what? It's, uh, I, I always say, yeah, I always say that I, I learned about 80 or 90 percent of what I ever knew about racing uh, actually from racing little cars. And then you just have to later on, you just get in them and drive them. Oh, well, I have, it begs the question and you you may have answered it maybe tongue in cheek. Were there some things about that type of racing that really did help you when you actually got into a real car? Oh, 100 uh, percent. Mental focus, discipline, uh, preparation, dealing with sponsors, dealing with other competitors, literally everything. And, and even the dynamics, you know, when you're building your own RC cars, you become obsessive about tiny things. And then when you extend that to big cars, you realize that uh, the devil's in the details. So yeah. I, I seriously, I, all that I had to learn when I went to full size cars was just a little bit about the physics of being inside it instead of outside it. Well, they say with racing, most of the success in racing is before you even arrive at the track, all that preparation, which uh, most certainly becomes true. So, But I I like the business aspect of it, the client relation, the sponsor relation, communication skills. I mean, for a young young man, 13-year-old, those are all things that many young kids aren't really taught. And if they're not, they don't do very well in the communication side as they get older. Sounds like you had that all dialed in. Well, I don't have it dialed in, but I do remember when I was 13, I guess, or 14, I already had a, my first sponsor was a manufacturer of a reasonably good car. But then I went to the U.S. Nationals and I remember seeing the uh, president of, you know, the our equivalent of Enzo Ferrari, basically sitting on the sidelines uh, or Penske or someone. And um, <clears throat> I'd always wanted to race with them. And, and I just, I was nervous, but I, I actually, my, my mother was there too. And I asked her and she said, well, you should just go do it. Yeah. So I just uh, screwed up my gumption and walked over to him and said, uh, hello, sir, you don't know who I am, but I've won this regional championship. And I'm here at the Nationals and I've, I've run your cars before and I'd really like to drive for you. And he said, well, let's take a look at that. And then, you know, a few weeks later, I was on a on a deal, uh, a partial ride. And then, you know, after I did I performed pretty well, I was on a full ride. And then they started flying me to Japan. And so it's like, it, was, it just, um, uh, when, when you're lucky enough to be in a position to do that when you're young and have some success with it, it kind of puts you on the path of saying like, okay, I, I can do this or, or why not me? Walk up and ask, why not me? Yeah, I love it. Well, let me give you a proper introduction. We're going to dive into a very interesting world of yours. Andrew Camry Picard is an X Games medalist, North American rally champion, Pikes Peak record holder, and Baja 1000 class winner. He's also driven in movies as a stuntman, uh, has appeared in Fast and Furious and the Deadpool franchises, and designed the massive car stunt course on Netflix's Hyperdrive. He was a main expedition member earlier this year for the first overland crossing from the continental shelf of North America to the high Arctic, driving over 2,200 kilometers in temperatures below minus 30, oh my gosh, to the Arctic Ocean. And after one of those vehicles fell through the ice, well... Andrew went back with his team and extracted it from the floor of the Arctic Ocean. I want to hear about that. And brought it back south by helicopter. He's also a big tire nerd and founded his business in L.A., Zip Tire Mobile Tire, uh, to disrupt the tire industry and is the chief business officer for Arctic Trucks North America. You are one busy guy. We're going to learn more about you, Andrew, in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors. So give them a little love. They keep the fuel in the tanks here and we'll be right back. I've enjoyed the quality and variety of Lloyd's floor mats for decades now, and I'm super excited to report that Lloyd's mat store is now part of the Covercraft family of products, car care that protects the things that move you. Lloyd's floor mats are the ultimate in quality and fit with carpet mats, all-weather mats, Velour Tex, Berber, Classic Loop Carpet, 
and they're proudly made in the USA. They're designed and sewn with the highest of quality and offer custom fitment for almost any vehicle. There's a wide variety of styles, fabrics, and colors to choose from, and hundreds of licensed logos as well. Protect your vehicle's factory carpets from moisture, dirt, mud, snow, slush, anything that Mother Nature can throw your way. All of your options are quality made, easy to clean, they secure to the floor, and they look oh so good. Check out Lloyd's Mat Store for a wide variety of styles, colors, and options for your vehicle today. And I've got a special deal for you. If you use the code CARS, yeah, C-A-R-S-Y-E-A-H at Lloyd'sMatStore.com, you'll get $10 off. Just use the code CARS, yeah, at L-L-O-Y-D. M-A-T-S-S-T-O-R-E dot com. Lloyd's Matt Store dot com. Covercraft and Lloyd's Mats. Protecting the things that move you. When it was time to renew my collector car policy, my carrier raised my rates by a lot. But why? My usage was the same. My car's value was the same. And I had never made a claim. I didn't even have a ticket. The only change was their rate and they had no reason why. What's with that? I researched my options. I spoke to others and with American Collectors Insurance, what a difference. A live person actually answers the phone. She spent time learning about me and provided a reasonable quote. Why wait until your next premium is due? Give them a call today for your personal agreed value quote. Call 866-AC1-YEAH. That's 866-224-9324. Tell him you're a friend of mine, Mark Green at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance, classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors, automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. That's American Collectors Insurance. Fall is here, and you know what that means. Time to put a good coat of protection on your vehicle. I'm teamed up with AutoGeek, and they've been the leading source of auto detailing products, accessories, and expert knowledge for more than 20 years. What started back in 1997 as a small mail-order catalog company grew into a multi-website-based e-commerce store, and that's what they are today. With a large online presence on its own website featuring close to 100 different brands, AutoGeek has grown to be the largest car care retailer in the country. AutoGeek's wholesale program serves accounts in over 30 countries, and its retail sector ships worldwide. If you want to protect your vehicle this fall, and you should, go to AutoGeek.net for the best product selection on the internet today and technical support. AutoGeek.net is where I go for my detailing needs. That's AutoGeek.net. So, Andrew, what an interesting life from racing to business owner to picking up cars off the Arctic Ocean and flying them back. Oh, my gosh. I first want to go back to your racing career and how that all evolved and all the things you've done with that. But, of course, I want to talk about Zip Tire because I love the entire concept and some of the other crazy things you've done. But let's start by going back in time with your racing career, how this all came to fruition. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I, I grew up as a kid on a farm outside of Edmonton, Alberta. I was an only child and kind of a latchkey only child on a ranch. So basically, uh, you know, I had tractors and dirt bikes and eventually dune buggies and snowmobiles and stuff. And I just I just messed around, you know, and Malcolm Gladwell talks about the 10,000 hours you have to do to, oh, yeah. to develop an expertise. Like, yeah, I think I had my 10,000 hours in by like age eight. I, you know, I, I rolled my dad's pickup when I was nine or 10 years old in the field. And oh, oh my gosh. It was just messing around and getting stuck and going through snow drifts with vehicles and dune buggies and dirt bikes in the spring and, and, and ATVs on the ice. And this is in the 80s, the late 70s. So the, the stuff was pretty primitive. But, but basically, I didn't know that I was preparing myself for a career in rally racing. But it turns out that's exactly i think how you do it well rally racing i almost can't watch you guys on you know i go on youtube and watch these videos and i love racing and i love watching racing but there's two types of racing that makes me so nervous one is motor gp and i I used to ride motorcycles and i watch those guys and i'm just in awe and the other are you rally drivers oh my gosh Uh, it's like you live in a different time warp. And I like to ask drivers who've been rallied or are rally drivers on the show here is how do you do that? Because it seems like the car is moving faster than your reaction and brain ca- actually can. That's, a, that's an interesting question. So, you know, Ross Bentley uh, introduced me to you and yes. he's a fantastic driver coach. And I can tell you about how we work together for, for, for a time. The answer is 
uh, there's two answers to this. It, it, honestly, it's the only motorsport that ever really turned me on. Mm-hmm. I have done some track racing and endurance racing, and people have hired me to drive their cars, which has been wonderful. But I am at core really a rally racer, and that's because I like the breadth of the challenge. Uh, I, I call it flirting with the laws of physics. Yes, there you go. Yeah, all racing, that's an old Porsche ad from the 80s, but <laughs> all racing is, in a sense, and uh, you know, the slogan for the rally racing in the U.S. has been real cars, real roads, real fast. But what appeals to me is that you take a vehicle that's, you know, a street, street-based vehicle, and you go down the most difficult sort of country or mountain roads you can imagine, logging roads, and then you just you, you do it at, at 10 or 11 tenths. And I, I just I love being out on the edge. And, you know, being on the edge on the racetrack is something when you're, you know, uh, when you're at the limit of physics and when you're, you know, you, you have the tire even on a little bit of a slip angle and you're working the tire completely. But for me, there's nothing better than it being like 11 at night in the dark uh, and it's cold and you're flying sideways over a jump and you got to, you know, you're trying to figure out which wheel is going to touch down in the darkness first. And you're trying to read the surface and you got a co-driver calling notes to you. And it's like, it's all chaos and you're trying to make sense of it. And it just comes down to you and, and your co-driver and, and your preparation and your your, your, your skills in this. And, mm-hmm. and I, I love it. And, and the reference to Ross, Ross Bentley is that when you get experience at it, or when you get good at it, everything slows down a lot more than you'd expect. And I know this is true on the racetrack too. And it's true for those MotoGP guys who I also think are crazy that the Isle of man stuff drives me bonkers. That, that's, watch, a, but, that's another level of insanity yeah. for sure. And skill set. But when you're in that zone, everything slows down. And I, I mean, I can close my eyes right now and, and, you know, recall it happening on so many occasions of just, everything slows down. The road gets longer. It's like that shot in vertigo where like they zoom in while they, while they pull out and, and it just, it, and you get calm. A, a university research team once put a heart monitor on me. And this is true of a lot of racers, I think before a race on the start line of the stage. And my, I almost fall asleep. My pulse goes down to like about 50 beats and, and it's gone below. And, and it's just, it's, because it's where I'm best and I'm in the zone and I'm, you can't focus on anything else. Like you're not thinking about what's going on back at the office or anything else at all. It, the focus is complete and you get in the zone and it's just like dancing and it's quiet and it's wonderful. So I, I know it looks like chaos from the outside yeah. and I love that about it. And I love that you can, when spectators watch it, you know, on the track, it's fun to watch, you know, track racing, but, but you know, the passes can be dramatic, but it's never like seeing a car flying sideways, spitting out dust and flames. And, and I, I like that by contrast in the car, it's actually pretty calm. Whew. Wow. Okay. I'll believe you. <laughs> It's a bit like life. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe moments in life. It's amazing. Now, another thing that it looks like you've had some fun with, obviously, you've played in the X Games. You've done Pikes Peak. You've done Baja 1000, which is a, kind of similar to rally racing. I mean, you're driving through Mexico and so forth, but also some stunt driving with movies and so forth. Now, I would imagine that is probably not nearly as exciting as some of the other racing you've done. Well, it's different. The movie stunt stuff is interesting. So I did for a brief period, I was, I did pro drifting. I drove the Dodge Viper and the Formula Drift series. And, and that actually is the closest type of motorsport to film stunt driving because it's it, it, drifting like films is wait, 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 go be awesome. And then, okay, we're moving on to the next thing. Yeah. But what I like in, in the evolution for me in movie stunts and, and TV stuff is that I've, I've now evolved a little bit more into the stunt coordinating area where you get to design the stunts. And that's really fun for me because I've been in, you know, I've done the stunts for movies and TV and, and then I've, I've been in production and worked in creating some shows and then sort of melding those together. People come and say, OK, so we want to, you know, if we wanted to do something like this or create a chase like that or in the case of Hyperdrive on Netflix. OK, so we want to do American Ninja Warrior, but with cars. I'm like, great, you know, and, and here's 100 acres. And, a, you know, let, let's build a six story high teeter totter and a rail slide. Like for me, that's the. The real jam, because I get to design stuff, knowing what cars can do, having built car. Not every racer is kind of a car builder. I, I had to be a builder in the early days because I couldn't afford to buy race cars. So I built them. And and, and so I, I, I enjoy making the machines work and designing the courses for them. And then that extends to movies and stuff, too. So it's been it's been a real, real growth. It's real fun. It actually is massively it can be massively time consuming if you go to a feature movie you know you might go overseas for two months or something so it's hard to square that with other things uh so i kind of i kind of i'm lucky to be able to pick and choose a little bit what i do there but i always say there's, there's a few of us in hollywood is you know there's a great group of drivers in hollywood but every stunt man and woman has a driver's license so in theory anybody can drive the cars but what's happened in the last 
I don't know, 10, 15 years or so. And it kind of started with, actually started with Rod Millen and, and like TV ads, you know, moving on to some of the early Fast and Furious stuff where they realized, oh, you can, you can get driver stunt guys who are actually really good at the driving thing. And that was guys like, uh, you know, they're still, they're still driving. Some of them, Reese Millen, certainly Rod's son and mm-hmm. Tanner Faust, Samuel Huben, guys who came from rally and drifting and went into movie and TV stunts because I always say, you know, call one of us if you want to just barely not crash the car. <laughs> um, if, if, if Anybody can drive into a wall or flip something over. But if you want to, like, slide it around and look like it's going to crash or or there's the stakes are really high, like in Atomic Blonde, uh, Charlize Theron was in the front seat of the car and I was driving it from the back seat with the second set of controls, you know, down an alley in Budapest doing reverse 180s. That's a good day <laughs> in my yeah. stunt world because, you know, everything it's the same as rally. Everything's on the line. You got to deliver right now. And I, I love the pressure. And when it comes on, everything slows down and I like delivering. <laughs> and you do. Well, I want to hear a little bit about this uh, high Arctic trip you took and then extracting a car from the Arctic Ocean floor and bringing it back by helicopter. What happened? Yeah. So as I was sort of, um, you know, I, I was lucky to have good success in the rally world and won the North American. So by my mid 40s, which is now you know six years ago, I uh, was sort of blending out of rallying, and I was trying to think, what's the biggest challenge you can do with a vehicle? And I started pitching something that nobody's ever done before, which is to drive from one of the Earth's poles to the other. Uh, people have gone roads end to roads end and so on, but nobody's ever driven the surface of the planet from like the South Pole to the North Pole. So. I, and I worked for a number of years to try to get that over the line financially with sponsors. And we talked to manufacturers and, and outlets, you know, media outlets. And I had to put on the back burner starting Zip Tire and other stuff. And, and But then I got a call a couple of years ago from a European outfit out of Switzerland who said, we're just going to do it. So do you want to you know join us? <laughs> so I, yeah. 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 So. So, and actually that, you know, we're going all the way around. We're going from, from through both poles and all the way back. So it's a full lap of the earth vertically. And so in order to fill in the gaps that have never been done, we had to go and do a test. So on the team, there's six of us that are main expedition members on the team are guys like Emil Grimson, who runs Arctic trucks out of Iceland. They've done 370,000 kilometers in Antarctica. Uh, there's a, a Russian explorer, ex-Soviet mountaineer, Olympic mountaineer named uh, Vasily Lagan, who designed amphibious vehicles that have already been across the North Pole. Uh, the Arctic trucks have already done the length of Greenland. So the only things that were missing were nobody's ever gone coast to coast on Antarctica with vehicles. Um, and now we've tested that. And nobody had ever driven from the continental shelf of North America to the high Arctic. Nobody just ever gone from the land to the high sea there. And it, it's very evocative for me personally, because there's kind of a Canadian history to it. I'm a Canadian uh, by birth. And and there's like the Northwest Passage and, and the John Franklin expedition and the 129 lost men and all this stuff. And, and it's really, it's pretty cool. So we had to go and figure out if it was possible before we say we're going to go all the way around the earth through both poles. we got to make sure that it truly can be done. And our team, somebody from our team has done all of it. And now we've done ab- absolutely all of it, but nobody had ever done this part. So we left from Yellowknife last March 4th, roughly this, this year, actually, and chartered a, a route overland over the tundra that no vehicle had ever gone over and then made it to the Arctic Ocean and then did about 1800 additional kilometers over the Arctic Ocean uh, to Resolute, which is the highest really civilian community. Um, there's an alert is basically a military outpost further north of that. But but we're and there are lots of indigenous people living all through the area, which it's been a real delight working with the indigenous people. And actually, I've now done it enough. And it's been such a wonderful relationship that they've given me an indigenous name. They call me Omil Goktok up there, which is for me, the, but the coolest thing in the world. Oh, is that? That's awesome. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so anyway, we took we took four amphibious uh, Yamelia vehicles from Russia and three Arctic trucks um, that we're now building in America. And we um, went overland, took us about three weeks um, to do the 2200 kilometers, very hard. Um, you know, I camped in a basically a summer tent at minus 35 and a 20 mile an hour wind. Oh, geez. Yeah, we got to points where we had polar bears. So we had to sleep either inside vehicles or on top of the vehicles. It's one of the most populated polar bear areas in the world. We, we And we got to Resolute, which is very far north on an island. And we, we went right past where the Franklin ships were lost and all these things. And then um, I was still, I stayed up there with the amphibious vehicles while the Icelandic guys said, okay, we're just going to get, get, we got to get the vehicles back to Yellowknife. And we already had the, the satellite track of the route we've taken to, you know, to the, to the meter. And we had been pulling a ground penetrating sonar device with us. So we had ice thickness data all the way along. Well, they on the route South five days later, just to get back to Yellowknife, we were leaving the amphibious vehicles in the North for next year, but to get the trucks back to Yellowknife, 
um, in the waning light, they went through an area that turned out had very heavy current underneath, and one of them fell through the ice. And I wasn't with them at the time, but I was monitoring them on the uh, on the satellite tracker, and I saw one of the trackers go dark, and that that's you know can be a technical error, but really that's not good. Not a good sign, no. I got the satellite pings from them, and fortunately they were able to step out. There was an indigenous guide that, that I'd hired that was in the passenger seat. He managed to step out, and then the Icelandic driver, a guy named Torfi, was very savvy, very um, a lot of emergency experience. He had the foresight to radio ahead to the other truck that was going down with them that we're going through, we're going through. They stepped out. The vehicle took about 45 seconds to sink. Um, they were in their stocking feet. They uh, jumped back on, it, it, Torfi jumped back on the vehicle and unstrapped a number of camping supplies. Um, and then they, uh, the vehicle went down. Wow. Unfortunately, only in about 25 feet of water. And that's why the ice was thin because the current turns out was fast near this island that we were, that they were crossing between. Got it. So they spent the night, a very fraught night in the heavier, uh, the other heavier truck with two other guys, um, they had to sort of keep the door slightly open in case they started falling through the ice from that one, but also mostly closed because they were being circled by two polar bears. Oh my gosh. And then, Jeez. yeah, and we sent, <laughs> we sent a chop. There were 400 kilometers from the nearest community. We, we, we sent, and we looked at going down with the amphibious, but it would have taken us like three to four days to get to them. So we sent a chopper and they, 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 in the morning they looked around and realized they were surrounded by open water and thin ice. They got the other vehicle though, uh, inched it to, sh- unloaded it, inched it to shore, left it there. Uh, we choppered them out. Then I came down with the amphibious vehicles three, four days later and um, <clears throat> looked, looked around, found the vehicle under the ice, geo you know, pinned it, and then went over to the island and, and got that vehicle off and did get it back down to a, a nearby community. And fast forward to this August, we realized, you know, the Arctic is an incredibly pristine, beautiful place, and we had to uh, do the right thing and get the vehicle out. It's it's scrap metal, really, because the salt water, you know, with the electronics and the composites and the alloys really did a number on it. But, we, you know, we Emil Grimson really from Iceland did the planning. Icelandic ice divers went to, and in August we still had ice flows going by, but we, we staged up a big chopper, um, a uh, Airbus Super Puma from Southern British Columbia, firefighting chopper. Had to stage it up in, in stages to get up there and then used it to go to this island 300 odd, 350 odd kilometers from the nearest community and camped on the island for a few days, attached airbags to the vehicle, lifted it to the surface, towed it in a very heavy current, actually very hard diving, towed it to the shore, flipped it over, pulled it up on shore, got some of the weight out of it, and then attached it to the Super Puma, which is the heaviest thing the helicopter had ever lifted, and uh, carried it down to a, a community from which we then barged it. It's now back in Montreal. So, the, the But it was an amazing, I mean, we had indigenous underwater camera operators and indigenous wildlife guides, and we found with them on this island that you would think was uninhabited, uh, we found meat caches and old camping sites from, given their size, probably at least hundreds and possibly thousands of years ago. So Whoa. you think that nobody's there, but they, this has been populated by Inuit for, you know, for centuries. So it was, um, it was amazing. Oh, gosh. Holy cow. What an adventure. Well, uh, we're going to take a short break for our sponsors. We come back. I do want to talk about Zip Tire, mobile tire in L.A. Yeah. So we'll talk about that in a second. Oh, I need to put my park on after that story. We'll be right back. You've heard me talk about Linkage Magazine here on Cars, yeah, for a couple of years now. Well, they're growing And in 2023, they're going to grow from four issues a year to six. And there's an opportunity here for you to take advantage of this growth. If you go to LinkageMag.com and click on the Renew button, if you already subscribe, you can get a great deal. Use the code RENEW6 for one year and you'll get six issues for the price of four or Type in Renew 12 for two years where you also have a great savings. Plus, they'll even throw in a free Linkage hat. How cool is that? The publisher of Linkage is Donald Osborne. He's been a guest multiple times here on Cars Yeah. He's become a good friend of mine. And I'll tell you, Linkage Magazine is one of those newer magazines that you're going to want to get. It's all about experiences, opinions, and values. It's a wonderful publication, something I look forward to getting. And now that I'm going to be getting six a year, (laughs) even more special. So go to LinkageMag.com. Again, use the code RENEW6 or RENEW12 to get that special deal. Do it before December 31st, 2022, so that in 2023, you'll get six issues of Linkage Magazine instead of four. Being a professional automotive technician today requires an understanding of technology, computers, and electrical systems that are highly advanced and very complex. Cars Yeah! is pleased to support TechForce Foundation. It's one of our charities of choice and its efforts to help young people pursue the technical education and careers as automotive techs. 
through scholarships, grants, and good old-fashioned hands-on experience with cars, trucks, boats, and more. TechForce and Carsia are working to connect young people with viable careers in the automotive sector. Join us by visiting techforce.org today. So, Andrew, uh, I want to talk about your other business. <laughs> you, you talk about scaling your life. My goodness, my friend, you do a lot of different things. Zip Tire Mobile Tire Service in Los Angeles. Tell us about that business, that company. What do you do? Yeah, well, look, about seven years ago, I was just getting out of pro rallying and I, you know, I'd had a shop or as a, you know, when I was sponsored by a manufacturer, we had a shop that I could use to put on tires on my street cars, you know, civilian cars. And then after I uh, quit racing, not days later, Michelin, for whom I'm, I'm a brand ambassador, sent me a set of tires for one of my street cars and they showed up on my porch. And I realized I was after, you know, 20 years of pro racing and having a shop, I was going to have to take these tires down to some shop and watch somebody mount them. Right. And I, I woke up the next morning, like with the light bulb over my head. Um, that like, wait a minute, I can take stuff from the race trucks that we've always had and, and offer civilians basically race service. You know, we'll go to them with with vans and put them on in their driveway. And and, and I, I thought I, I literally thought I was the first person who'd ever thought of this. You know, it was about seven years ago. And I called an executive I knew at Michelin and said, I'm going to change the tire business. And she said, <laughs> yeah, you know, Andrew, if a few folks have tried that, we've even tried it. You know, talk to this guy and that guy. And then I realized I had to do my research. I happened to be on the road with Michelin at the time doing trainings. And so I invited every tire mobile tire guy across the country basically to come out to the Michelin show. And met them all, saw their trucks, talked to them about how it worked, and then just came back to my backyard and bought a Ford Transit and backed it in my yard and built it. And as a tire truck, and that that truck now is about 150,000 miles and, and several thousand jobs on it. And then I hired a guy and built another truck and hired another guy and hired another guy and built another truck. And that's kind of where Zip Tire came from. We now have a little shop in Los Angeles and we have lots of happy customers. And we have a 98 NPS, which basically means everybody gives us a five star review. And uh, pretty much everybody says they'll never go to a tire store again. You know, Mobile service is one thing, and we're pretty good at delivering it. It's complicated, and the margins are tough uh, compared to a you know brick and mortar tire store. People roll up, and you're like, okay, I see what you have in your car, and and you know you're gonna wait until I put them on, right? Mm -hmm. We have to schedule when we're gonna be there. We have to have the factory inputs, the right tire on the right truck. You have to have technicians that can not only do the work but are the face of the company, and they have to be like Marines or frankly like rally mechanics, where you know you never leave somebody in the field. You you always have to get the job done. So. We solved all that. But the thing that we're really working on, and actually, I think is the thing that really sets us apart is that, you know, if he, so I trained a couple of thousand tire dealers on tire technology because I'm a big tire nerd from racing. And I learned I had the background to be able to learn about the tires. And so that's why I became a trainer for Michelin. So after training all these dealers, I realized that some dealers are really great, but a lot of dealer tech, you know, people in the front office zone don't actually know that much about tires. You know, what you want is that guy behind the counter who you walk up to and say, hey, I need a set of tires. I'm like, great. I, you know, how do you drive? Let me see your vehicle. Okay, I can make a great you know, recommendation. But often they're selling the tires that they have in stock or that it's a good deal for them or that they get a spiff on or whatever. What I'm trying to do now because people are buying tires online so much more and you, there's no way to get that guy behind the counter online. So one of the things that sets us apart is that, you know, if you call us or if you start texting or emailing with us, we we really work hard to give you authentic, you know, well-founded recommendations for the tires you should really have in your car, right? Mm. And and that's something like we're just trying to not just be mobile, but also be the best tire shop you've ever talked to. And that's the thing that right now I'm focused on baking into an, an e-commerce model so that you'll be able to come to Zip Tire and really get a good recommendation for what you need and have the confidence that we've 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 done right by you. And we're lucky because we don't have to stock the tires. We we just in time inventory everything with all our distributors. So we can we have a the ability to broadly recommend almost any kind of tire for your car and put it on like tomorrow. So um, that's our model and that's where we're really setting ourselves apart. We haven't taken investment yet. We bootstrapped it and I've invested in it. We're now at the stage where we're looking for investors or partners, mm -hmm. um, possibly brick and mortar partners or chains, um, because in order to really grow, we basically know how to do this now, but we have to add the fuel to the fire and really, really go to the next step. So that's where we're at. That's awesome. I love it. It's really cool. Now, right now, are you primarily just in Los Angeles? We are, yeah. If you know LA geography, we basically do the, from the valley in the north down to Long Beach in the south and like the 605 to the ocean. But it's a great, you know, it's a big block, yeah. a lot of people, a lot of, people. A lot of cars, yep. and it's a very smooth demand because we don't have a winter changeover. We, there are, we have friends uh, like, like um, Tyra Butler in Toronto, who I can recommend to you, anybody in Toronto listening. Uh, they've got a bunch of vans, and they're in the changeover season, and right now they're, they're off their heads. And that's a different problem to solve, but it's also solvable. Uh, but we like L.A. because people need tires here every day. Yeah. And how nice to be able to, say, go to work and have you guys come out while you're sitting in your office and not have to go to a tire store and sit and wait or take your weekend time up and all of that. So uh, I love it. It's a, it's a really wonderful idea. 
You know, I always like to ask people about what I call our driving inspirations, key mentors in your life, influencers. Has there been a, I mean, you probably worked around so many influential people, but there, is there one that stands out for you? Well, it's interesting. I, you know, I've, I've been lucky to work in a bunch of different areas and I've, I've known some film directors and some race, you know, directors and some, you know, some team captains who've been really great um, and have been uh, inspirational in their own ways. But honestly, for me, it's probably my mother mm. um, who uh, not only uh, supported all my hijinks while I was a kid. I mean, I, I flipped end over end of the X Games while she was in the stands, I remember. And oh. she like she nearly at 65 years old, nearly like sprinted down through the bleachers. But she, you know, she herself kind of she or she raced in the 60s herself raced cars really and oh cool yep yep <laughs> and then she became a federal judge and she, she she taught me she taught me how to how to heel and toe downshift and how to punch it mid corner in an audi or quattro if some of your li- listeners know what that is so yeah um i i, I came by my 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 problems honestly <laughs> <laughs> i love it what a great story mom who races that's the coolest thing well I always ask my guests about what I call the challenge question. It's almost a silly question for racers because racing is fraught with challenges. I always say one weekend you're a champion, the next you're a chump. I mean, it's just the the nature of racing. But is there one big challenge in your life that has really, really stood out, but more importantly, taught you an incredibly valuable lesson on the other end? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, honestly, Zip Tire you know, building a business where there's been no business before in a, in a segment that you're not in has been, has been a real challenge. And that's been uh, sometimes terrifying and sometimes very satisfying. However, I mean, if I had to take away anything from both the racing and from zip tire, I remember, I remember a moment where, you know, we were down to our last, the last bit of our budget, we were over, you know, we had no more money and, and we were living in a hauler and the car was broken and the engine was blown. And, and, you, you know, you just have to have that, you know, just the grit and the and the endurance to go on one step. I I I can think of a moment in 2006. They announced that rally racing was going to the X Games. Uh, we'd already we won the first event of the season, but we weren't pre chosen to be one of the 12, which included like Colin McRae and you know super famous guys and 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 Travis Pastrana, Ken Block, Tanner Faust, all, all the you know all the guys you've heard of now. And I had to qualify, and uh, you know we were leading the race or we were second place in the race. We would have qualified, and then the hood flipped up on the car uh, about 11 miles from the end of a stage finish. Oh shattered gosh. the windshield and, and we could only see like out the bottom of the windshield, like about four inches oh, tall or whatever. My God. Wow. But y- you just never quit. And so we just kept going. We lost about 45 seconds in that stage. We dropped down about two places or three places out of contention for qualifying for the X hands. We got back to service, um, you know, taped the windshield as best possible. Frankly, the scrutineers kind of looked the other way and said, well, all right, if you think it's okay, you go, go out. <laughs> right. And, and we went out and, and then because I was at that point, ready to leave the car on fire in the woods, like walk away from it, which is what, you know, what, what, you know, ultimately for the fastest rally racing, you have to feel like we went to a whole other level and, and Ross Bentley can tell, you know, we can talk about that too, but we just went to a different level and we won this, we won the stage by like armfuls of seconds and eventually minutes and stuff and, and clawed back up and qualified for the X games by like three seconds. And I went from, you know, probably this was the end of my rally career to then a whole second chapter of, uh, being the first, the first five X games were me, Ken Block, Tanner Faust, and Travis Pastrana. So I got into the extreme sports, and that got me to other things. And and it was really a turning point. And it was just the not giving up and putting the foot to the floor, and then throwing everything in. And and honestly, that that's it's the same application to business. I'm not surprised that you see some racers be successful in business from the Penskys and 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 other people, you know, the Carol Shelby's and and and, and Snake Oil salesmen. But you just gotta. So you just got to double down and downshift and punch it, you know? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, you said it. I mean, you got to throw everything in. And I have to ask a question. If that had not happened, that hood had not come up, do you think you would have gotten to the place you did in that particular event? Or did that just like ign- fully ignite a fire that was already there and just blow it up to cause you to go, OK, we're going to do this? Well, it the the main revelation look i you know life can work out and all I, i'm a believer in the sliding doors thing like <clears throat> there, there are a bunch of possible futures for you and for everybody right like if it didn't work out one way it might work out a different way but what i have learned from episodes like that is that even when you think you're maxed out or even when you think you're at your your best there can be a level that you go to that is a level even even further that's getting in the zone or that's that's really really where you you 
I, I, I always think of it, sometimes think of it as like a stone skipping over the water where suddenly you're, you're, you're cheating all the rules because you're, you're above <laughs> them, you know, yeah. um, not, not really illegally, but like you just that you're, you just go to another level and, and those moments are, are, um, are worth seeking out. And, and you sometimes you just have to challenge yourself to get to them. And sometimes the challenge is going to find you, but the moral for me is don't lift, like, like stay in it. Yeah. You know, this is uh, akin to uh, professional athletes and let's say Navy SEALs, where they say where you think, when you think you are at the end, you can't do any more. You're only about a third of the way there. Truly. Right. You, you got to dig yep. deep and there's different things you pull up. And Ross Bentley, uh, yeah, certainly can. He's I've known him for years and uh, he talks about that. Other people I've had on the show that talk about coaching and bringing that spirit out of you that you didn't even know was there is quite phenomenal. So I love it. Now you've done so many crazy, wild, fun things in your driving career. Is there a bucket list item you haven't done? You still want to do? <laughs> oh, here we go. Well, <laughs> I, I, well I, look at, at the moment, I just really want to, to mess up the tire industry and, and be there the moment that the, it pivots over to where people realize, wait a minute, I don't have to go to a tire store. So, or, or at least, you know, I, if we partner with a tire chain, you know, it, it, there's this possibibility for premium service, maybe that, that, that changes the business. But, you know, I, I'm really lucky. I now have a young family. I've got a wonderful wife and, and I've got a few old cars I tinker with. I, I don't really have a lot of personal needs for, you know, for myself. You know, would we like to vacation more and do other stuff? Sure. Um, I, if, if I did, I'll, I'll throw this out because you get a lot of car fans. If I could buy one thing or have one thing. I've always wanted a W.O. Bentley, like a late 20s Bentley, oh. um, because for me, it's like the complete car. Uh, and so, you know, because you can drive it from Peking to Paris and you can park it in front of the Savoy or the Ritz, right? So I um, and, and my, my friend Bruce Meyer in town here has one that I lust over. But, um, <laughs> you know, so that that's a goal. It's a you know, bucket list thing. But I, you know, if, I, if I never get one, it's OK. I, I want to see my kids follow their passions. They work on the cars with me now, and but whatever they're into, I want to support, want to be in a financial position to make sure that they launch um, and just want to take care of the family. But, but, you know, my bucket list is really um, make, make, make zip tire succeed and, uh, and daughter off with some bonkers old cars into my old age. At Bruce Meyer, he has all the cool stuff. You know? Doesn't he? <laughs> he does. Yeah, he does. So special vehicle story, one special vehicle in your life that really stands out even to this day. What was it? And tell us a story about it. That's interesting. Well, you never really get over your first car, probably, right? right? Yeah. Um, so I was lucky enough. I had a, um, for the, the Japanese car nerds in the crowd, I had a, an FC RX-7 Turbo. So like an 87 RX-7 Turbo, which was really my first car. And I, I realize now what a fantastic car it was. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I lived, I more or less lived in that car for, you know, 10 years, uh, learning how to drive, drove it everywhere, uh, across the country, off to college, you know, and, and through the snow and, and, you know, it just didn't seem like a bad idea in the eighties to have a rear wheel drive car through, through the winter. <laughs> and I really, unfortunately, it's one of the only two cars that I regret having to let go. And cause I had no money and couldn't keep, take it with me when I moved to New York and stuff. But, yeah. but that there's definitely like that, that set the tone for, for my whole life with cars and FCR seven. And then I'm cheating by having another one, but That's um, okay. <laughs> about about four years ago or five years ago, I kind of always wanted to get a Ford Model T, and uh, I found one in Pasadena. <laughs> okay, wait a minute, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, what? Why? <laughs> <laughs> this doesn't make sense. Well, no. So I'm I'm a real automotive history nerd too, and and I love oh, the okay. machine. And, yeah. And so you know, it's the last iteration of a different drive line. Like you drive it differently. It's a hand right. throttle and hand ignition and, and the, the right pedals, the brake and all this stuff. And I just, I, and it's, it, you know, and it, it's such an important car historically. I've, I've got, I'm lucky that some of the cars that I have are, are, you know, I mean, Bruce has amazing cars, but I, I kind of have, I have cars that I'm attracted to, but they tend to be like milestone cars. And the Model T is that. And also, you know, I have these two young girls they are now seven and nine years old. And, and I wanted to be able to, for, for them to be able to have some car fun around LA. So I, I found, I found for eight, like eight grand, I found a model T that the guy had restored in high school. He's, he's 80 ish years old, still had it. Wow. Um, and and reason, it hadn't run for 20 or 30 years, but reasonably good shape. And they they last. So bought it, dragged it back here, recommissioned it. And we use that darn thing. Like I drive them to school almost every day. And I, I, I wired a couple of car seats in the back. Really? Um, Wow. Yeah, yeah, and and put some Rocky Mountain brakes on it and a Ruxtel. If, if people know that, it came with a Ruxtel. Um, and so we drive a Model T. Like we bring the Christmas tree home with it in Hollywood, and <laughs> like people stop and people stop and clap. And the thing is, like I, I've got a couple of cool cars. Again, not like Bruce, but but 
if you're driving a classic car, you're hopefully you're having fun. But other people may like it, but, you know, it doesn't necessarily make them happy. The Model T makes everybody happy. Like, people smile. And because you're driving a bit of automotive history, and it's so weird, and you have the ooga horn and an exhaust whistle, and, and um, it just makes people happy. So that that's that's my new go-to car. Yeah, what a fun story. And years, decades ago, we were shooting uh, classic cars for a catalog business I was part of, and we borrowed this guy's old Bentley, very similar to the kind of car that, 20s that you know that you're talking about and when he brought it it was it was for our I think it was for a winter catalog so he brought it close to christmas and he pulled it in and he drives his cars these are not garage queens or collector cars in the way of a museum and i said why are there pine needles all over and he goes oh the kids and i we went and got our christmas tree this weekend in this car and drove it home and said that had to attract a lot of people taking pictures he goes oh yeah we're probably all over the internet so um yeah very very fun stuff now i'm gonna ask you a question that i'm guessing no one's ever asked you i'm gonna be your car psychologist today if you were reincarnated, pun intended, manifest as a vehicle. Now, this isn't what you want to be, uh, Andrew. This is you perceiving the kind of person you are in the mirror as a vehicle. Got to dig deep for me here today. What would you be and why? Yeah, well, it's, it's tough to separate out um, your your self-image from your your actual... Yes, um, who you really uh, are. Self, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I um, am not a... Um, I love sleepers and I love being a bit of a sleeper. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my daily is actually a, a 2006 Pontiac GTO, you know, Holden Monaro. Okay. Um, and somewhere in that range is what I, I both imagined myself to be and would like to be. I always said in a way, the ultimate vehicle is something like a BMW M5 mm -hmm. where yeah. it's like, it's, it is, a, it's a performance weapon, but people don't realize it. Uh, or, or viewers don't realize it and it can slip in. It's the, you know, it's the best car for, for crooks, right. Or for Ronin type <laughs> movies. Yeah. Um, because, yeah. um, no, nobody notices it. So I think that's what I'd like to be. Um, I also, but, but I like being different. Like I, I like, I like doing things and, and, you know, this LA's crawling with M5. So, you know, I'm probably that's, I probably, I drive the GTO a little bit because, I kind of want to be like that, mm -hmm. both not, not just kind of a sleeper, but kind of a different sleep. So, I, so I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I but, get it. Yeah, um, yeah, I get yeah. it. Well, first time I ever drove an M5, I couldn't believe it because I've always had M3s and 911s, and I went, "Oh my gosh!" You, <laughs> you put your foot down. This car keeps pulling and pulling and pulling. It's like, when is it going to back off? It's not. You yeah. better lift. Yeah, those. Car, yeah. The number of the number of racers I know that have M5s is actually astonishing. If you, if you if you did a survey, um, and, and you know any of them will respect it. <clears throat> so it's it's just it's kind of the you know complete pack. And you know there's there are other one. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm a big Ford guy. Like, uh, actually, I've just have been messing around with Ford Lightnings, and those are fantastic vehicles. Uh, and that's that's the direction the industry is going. And I love I love Teslas and things too. But I think that you know, for the complete package, that's 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 kind of it for me. Yeah, I parked yesterday at the grocery store next to my first uh, Ford F one fifty all electric pickup truck, and the guy was plugging yeah. it in, and I said, "What do you think?" And he had a big smile on his face. He goes, "This is cool." And uh, yeah, so my next door neighbor drives a Raptor. I let me drive that when he got it. Those things are like rockets, uh, fast, yeah. fast cars. So yeah, cool stuff. Well, I'm just really lucky. I work with Ford a lot, um, and so I was testing the Lightnings even last summer. And I, the first time I mashed the throttle in that truck, in a pickup truck, and it, it pulled out of the gate, you just you, don't, you cannot believe the acceleration. And then because <laughs> the center of gravity is so low, um, because, you know, the battery array is below the floor and, you, and the, the ice engine is gone, um, <clears throat> the, the chassis dynamics are much more like a sports car. So it, 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 it changes everything. Changes everything. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. Yeah, that's very cool. Now, uh, we love books here at Cars, yeah. Is there a great book that you'd like to share with us? You know, I... Um, Man, in my youth, I read a lot, and I just haven't had time as much uh, in later years. I but I will. There are a few interesting ones. My friend Alex Roy, who's a real autonomy guy, most recently at Argo AI, and I'm, I'm very interested in autonomy. I actually worked with Google X on uh, the chauffeur cars, the early autonomous cars, and I find that whole area very interesting. And I really want to make autonomous cars drive better, more like us, not like uh, the tech, not like engineers, or not like programmers think they should drive. Humans aren't the problem in driving. Just bad humans are the problem. So we, <laughs> we need to distill. Yeah. Yeah. We need to distill good driving into the vehicle. So I'm, I'm yeah. kind of fascinated by that. So in that, there's a couple of interesting books. There's one called Traffic, um, which is, uh, I forget the name of the author, but 
Uh, it's really good in delving into the psychology and the um, the subtleties about everything from rules of the road to eye contact to just sort of the, the, the way that uh, we've developed the social system in driving. And so I really recommend that. It's it's quasi-academic, but it's it's really worth a read. It's called Traffic. Traffic. Um, Is that um, by Tom Van- Vanderbilt? Yeah, that's right. Tra- yeah, that's wh- Tom yeah, why we drive, the way we do something about the, it says something about us. I'm, yeah, I'm familiar with that. Sure. Very, very worthwhile read, and it'll get you thinking. And I recommend it to anybody certainly listening to this podcast. And then I also, I've, I've been, it's, it's been a real pleasure. I'm, I'm not a huge podcast listener, although I will now uh, review all of yours. But well, of course, I, um, yeah, there's only 20, yeah. 2,204 of them now. So if you're going to go on yeah. another Arctic trip, you'll have something to listen to on that long drive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, exactly. But I, I have benefited from how I built this by Guy Raz. Oh, yeah. Um, which, um, which, yeah, really, it's very strong. NPR, you know, but, um, but it gets on founders, people who build companies. And, and it's, it's, it's better than business school, really, because you're like, oh, you're feeling the pain that I'm feeling or you're going through the things I'm, I've gone through, or you've gone through them. And there's a lot of insights there. So I recommend that. I love it. So I'm going to enable you to go on what I call the ultimate drive today, which you've already been on a lot of them. So this might be an interesting answer. Well, all your answers have been very interesting today. I'm going to provide you with any vehicle in the world. doesn't matter the cost. I'm going to park it in your garage. You can take it anywhere and you can take anybody with you, even somebody who's passed, somebody no longer with us. So that opens up a wide door of opportunities of talking to some very interesting people. So for a guy who's been on many, many, many ultimate drives, what's your ultimate drive today, Andrew? <laughs> well, I've been I've been lucky to go, you know, in some pretty extreme northern uh, and Arctic type routes and stuff. Yeah. I one of the things that got me really into uh, exploration travel with vehicles was accounts of like the 1907 around the world race or the peaking to or the 1908 or the 1907 peaking to Paris. I think I would take a W.O. Bentley over a similar course, the peaking to Paris type thing like Mongolia mm. through through Eurasia. Uh, into Europe, nice, and and uh, make it like an overland, an overland thing. And honestly, in terms of a partner, I mean, I, I'd almost want a rotating cast of partners or a group of partners. I like um, that. Yeah, because it's, it's so hard to choose just one. And I mean, you could you could ask for like Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, and you know, you know, some some interesting world leaders. But I just um, I think I don't, I, I can't. I, I would just want to meet a, a, a rotating cast of characters, locals especially. Yeah. You know, one of the best things about traveling in the north has been meeting so many Inuit and learning about their culture. I, I kind of just want to meet new people. So I, I can't, I can't think of, you know, I can't think of somebody. Sure, I mean, would I would it be would I be curious to have Carol Shelby in the car for a while, or or um, Paul Newman, or you know, there's a lot, lots of lots of folks I'd like to sp- spend a few days with in a car. Right. But. I, it's it's always the new people and, and the people with new perspectives. So yeah. I, I I can't name anyone. Well, I like the answer. That's cool. And it's a unique answer too. I've had a lot of very unique uh, answers to that question, uh, not only cars, but people. Um, but I like the way you frame that is new people that you can learn new things from. Uh, that's what the car culture is all about. What I've learned after talking to so many people, you've taken us on a a wonderful trip today. I knew this would be fun. And uh, again, a big shout out to our mutual friend, Ross Bentley. He lives just about 30 minutes away from me, actually, uh, right down the street from where my son lives. He's an awesome guy and he's brought some great guests to the show. So Ross, thank you very, very much. Before I let you go today, could you uh, leave us with some words of inspiration, a mantra or a success quote? Never lift. <laughs> now, wait, you know, I know a guy that you know that is not going to like you for saying that because he says it's his his quote, and that would be Bruce Meyer. But I'll yeah, attribute that to right. you. <laughs> that's, his, that's his signature. It's like, I, I actually, I, yeah, it's true. It is. It's a good point, actually. It, it <laughs> And I don't mean to steal it. I, I like the Churchill, like, you know, never, never, never give up. It, it, just, it just means, like, I'll, I'll, I'll drop my own then. Stay in it. Just stay in it. You know, one thing that I neglected to touch on, or we neglected to touch on today that I know is important to you and your business careers, Arctic trucks. Tell me about that. Well, look, they're really cool. These these unique vehicles engineered in Iceland um, that are, are on up to 44-inch flotation tires, but aren't really raised off the ground because we have to do a lot of cross-slope work on the expeditions in Antarctica and in the Arctic. So it's, it's not like a lifted truck. It's, a, it's just a truck with very large tires, and it has onboard um, 
uh, inflation and deflation systems and everything you need to go to the Arctic or Antarctic. So we've just started, as of almost this week, building them in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So suddenly we now have Arctic trucks in North America, and I'm, I'm a, an officer of this company, and I'm really proud to bring those to the U.S. because people who are in the know have seen them from Iceland or in Iceland before. But now that we're building them here, we, we expect it to open up a whole sort of enthusiast community and uh, also you know, government and business contracting for it. So, so we're kind of excited about that. It's, a, it's our, our, one of our next big plays, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm really uh, happy to be able to, I mean, look, the brand was built by the Icelandic guys and Neil Grimson. They, and they did the engineering, they figured it out. They did 370,000 kilometers in Antarctica and now we're just, we're landing it in North America. So how can people go and find their website for them? They can go and see more about these. Yep. Yeah. Arctic trucks.us is the U S channel of it. You can get, you, you'll also find it through Arctic trucks.com or Arctic trucks.is for Iceland. But if you go to Arctic trucks.us, you'll, you'll see our operation here. And, um, uh, we'll be able to we'll be able to text, set you up with a truck. Absolutely, I'll put a link to that on Andrew Shono's page here on the Car Sale website. Check these things out; they are wild and crazy. Yeah, you can go anywhere in them. There we go. I love it, Andrew. Thanks for uh, being so generous today with your time and uh, the fun life you're living. Oh my gosh, you figured out the secret sauce to life. That's for sure. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you, no doubt, down the road, some unique road somewhere on the planet. I'm sure. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.